during the one speech. I now invite the first speaker for a side proposition. themselves 
Muslim and some other things that they're doing that they are bad mothers because they cannot do that. That they're limited by their circumstance and are doing their best but are still not allowed to do that. Right? I think that that narrative is extremely harmful. The second thing is that when you don't find value in motherhood, it begins to isolate you. That it tells women who have postnatal depression that they are bad mothers as opposed to the fact that they're actually depressed. It tells the overwhelming mothers of uh, the, the overwhelming amount of stay-at-home mothers in America who are now addicted to like, like crystal meth because they are depressed. That they are just bad mothers, they don't have issues, they don't have problems. Because to invalidate them as mothers by telling them that motherhood is inherently a rewarding experience, as opposed to the fact that there is subjectivity in it, as opposed to the fact that you can try and make and find your own value and tell them that motherhood is inherently valuable. And we think that that's something that needs to isolate you. But that's specifically harmful because we think that you need support in that time. That when you're not finding value in something that is so prevalent in your life, something that you do every single day, and you are isolated, you think that you are specifically harmed, that you're likely to end up in a much worse psychological state than you're already in, right? And that that's something that is inherent to that narrative, because it tells people that motherhood is inherently valuable. The third one is what happens when you just don't buy into motherhood at all, right? That when women want to abort children, that they may not have wanted to have children, that they may, that they may have never wanted to have by a rate, right? At the end of this, what, that, that what it tells career women and what it tells women who want to give up their babies for adoption is that they too are not invalid mothers, but are rather invalid people. That they're not seeking the highest reward in life and by extension do not deserve good things in life. That's why women who hit 27 and are good in their careers without children are still not treated, are still not treated properly, they're still not treated as full individuals. Because they took the highest reward and the one thing you want to aspire to in your life is being a mother. Because that is the highest reward. Shutting out any other room for what people may find rewarding in their life, shutting out any other room for what people may hate. Yes. So how do you come to the conclusion that women are born to motherhood, are forced into motherhood? We come to that conclusion because they never have room to opt into anything else. I made this conclusion in my context. That is something that they face from the moment they begin to understand language. But you know that people are very, people are very, like, um, people are against those counter narratives. They shut them down. They shut women down when they want to say that motherhood is difficult and continues to tell them that it is rewarding. There is no room for a counter narrative. The second part here, some harm them without their consent. So we already made the analysis on why we think that something that completely shuts us room for any other information. But I think that information is pivotal to a choice. That having an understanding of an alternative is what gives people a choice. If there is only ever one choice given to them, we don't think that that's valuable. But it's important because of things that are often, often inherent to motherhood, right? So this is independent of the value women may find in motherhood. Things like motherhood tax, when you're not allowed to get a good career, and you're not allowed to go, like move up the ladders in your workplace because you have the potential and you might just, because people expect you to, have a child, right? You think that it's things like the responsibility of an entire person. These are massive things to push onto someone if they never have a choice to opt out, if they never have the, the, the potential to find another version of what they find valuable, to find another version of what they believe is good, right? The lack of consent, we believe, makes it abhorrent and is inherent to the predominance of this narrative. And on that basis, we think that it is utterly regrettable. We think that motherhood may have value, but we don't think it has value for everyone, and on that basis, we regret that widespread narrative.
here in this debate, we have the opposition side agree with. I feel like the direction are being terminated. I feel like that encapsulates all they have said, they have been saying, because it just crushed their um, primary premise for all the arguments that they made in their first speech. Now, I'm going to move a little bit into what we the opposition side believe. We believe that people, when people think that uh, there is reward in being a mother, they ultimately, the ultimate outcome would be that they want to have kids. Now, we believe that if the society has women who want to have kids, it's something important for them. For two, for four reasons that I mentioned at the beginning, but I'm going to focus on two of them. The first one is the way that is the premise for the construction of a society. In two ways, in two ways. First, a society is made of people. And the way we, get, we have people is through birth. Is through birth. So if a lot of people are having and wanting to have kids because they feel like they're going to have a reward from them, uh, from it, we believe that it's something good for our society because we'll be having people uh, added to our society and making our society grow. But also in a second manner, we believe that when people think that motherhood is, is rewarding, they work for it. They want to do things for them to actually be put yet to their children and, uh, and satisfy their duty. And in this case, what they do is that they become good parents and they become good parents that create functional children that are able to contribute to our society. And we believe that some, that's something important for the construction of our society. Pointing. The society is not engaging with what it means to have a widespread narrative that completely shuts out the identity. We don't think motherhood is bad, we just hate the fact that everyone is told it's good for everyone. Now, that's actually what we are disagreeing with. We do not think that everyone is told that motherhood is good for everyone. It is something that we're not, that they were not being able to prove to us. We believe that the site we live in, there's numerous, especially in this century, there's numerous ways that a, a child is given something to find uh, satisfaction in. It could be school, it could be a career, it could be anything else that we do not think that the society has been already need right now. Uh, forces us to think motherhood as the only uh, thing that's rewarding in our society. It's something that they were not able to prove, they were not able to prove that this narrative is true, and we're telling you that there are other means that society has known for now is giving satisfaction to these children as they grow up, as they say. And the second thing I want to talk about is how this idea brings about our economic growth. Because the only premise we uh, we're embracing more is that when people think motherhood can be rewarding, what they do is that they want to have kids. And if they want to have kids, what it means for an economy is that more people is that we're having more human resources because we're having more people coming in our societies. And we believe that this is something uh, important for society. It is important for a society that they have people coming in the society in order to contribute to their economic growth. And this is something that we find when people think that motherhood is an important thing. And it's something that can bring satisfaction. Now we like oh, taken. The, the core of this debate is about mothers who don't opt into that narrative and how you continue to harm them. You're trying to actually engage with that. Now, we do agree that some mothers do not see uh, a, a certain reward in the a certain reward in being a mother. But we also agree that these mothers, at some point, we adapt the system, and uh, as they adapt the system, what happens is that them too can see these rewards as we're saying. They're trying to paint them as people who are always sad, who are always depressed, and who are always wondering why they had kids. But that is not the case, because even the parents who have the best time, who have the best kids, have their moments where they feel that they do not bring enough. But that's not the whole story. They're, they're going a little bit into the details without looking at the whole picture in the whole. And we believe that the whole picture in the whole does not show that people who do not compromise with the norm are actually harmed by this idea and this belief. The third thing and the fourth thing that my second speaker and my third speaker are going to talk about and we're talking about is how this helps give a solution to orphan children in a way that these children can have a second chance even if they did not have parents who could care for them and another person who understands why motherhood is important and how motherhood can bring good to them who take care of them. And the fourth one is how it's going to lead to a reduction in child abandonment because mothers can understand, can see the reward in being a mother and can actually uh, not give up their children for let's say abortion or even leave them on the street as it is most time common. Now we understand
understand what the affirming your position of affirming science telling us. We understand that there's a number of people who may not fit in the narrative of saying that motherhood is rewarding. But we disagree with the fact that they're saying that in our society, uh, there's a narrative that's saying that motherhood is the ultimate reward that someone can get. We believe that the current society provides other means in which a person, a kid, can understand those other places they could find a reward. And with this premise, we understand that the points they were talking about do not hold because there are other means in which a kid in our society can find the world in what's going on. We're saying that it's an important thing for a human, for our society, for people to understand that motherhood could be something good for them and also could be something good for society as a whole for the four point mission. With all of that said, we believe that what we need to answer at this point is the question is, is, is the question of, that is asking is this narrative is this belief that motherhood is good, important for society to know? And we as the affirming society believe that it is important for society to know that motherhood is good for all the four reasons that were said in our first speech. With that said, allow me to wish you to enjoy it great. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, they can see to our case when they say that women and mothers play no role in society other than to birth children. Because ladies and gentlemen, they haven't listened to our harms. They haven't listened to our harms that explicitly detailed why it is so damaging and so harmful to women when they are told that the, the pain of childbirth, the pain of potentially not being able to financially support your child, the pain of, being, of your child being, of your child's development being out of your control is made up by the fact that it's a rewarding experience and therefore you must go contribute to society. They can see to all of our harms, moreover, that positive case doesn't even exist. Why have we won this debate? We won this debate according to several responses, and I've been proving to you with additional in my speech why this is worse in terms of the parental dynamic, but before that, let's dismantle their case. So what is their first response? Their first response is that this narrative can exist in coexistence with others, such as mothers finding reward in other things just pursuing their job. This isn't true to the debate, because we've already told you how this narrative is one that excludes other narratives. We told you in their speech that the act of motherhood is inherently taxing and comes at a cost to other aspects of your life. Therefore, in that instance, we would tell you that a narrative that promotes this as being a blanket benefit to all women is therefore one that says that there is a blanket benefit that is compensating the cost of motherhood. In those instances, we would tell you that there is the exclusion of other narratives. Secondly, we told you what a widespread narrative is. This takes off their stuff about when they tell us that, um, no, right, this doesn't force women into certain behavior. But it does, because what it does is it overcomes your utility calculus. Because the utility calculus for making a woman is that there's a certain cost to bring a child into this world, but this cost is recompensated by the reward I can potentially get. We've attacked that reward and we've told you that it doesn't apply for all women. Therefore, in those instances, their policy, that the, their application for the, their world is illegitimate. Secondly, we will tell you that societal pressures are increased because now not only can your woman, not only can your parents and your family tell you there's a need for you to have children and bring children to this world because that is your role in society, but in addition they can tell you that it's fine because there is a potential for reward. When that reward doesn't exist, when that reward is dubious, and that can be proven to you in our first speech because not all women are financially capable of taking care of their children, not all women are emotionally capable of taking care of their children, in that instance we will not it, not take it. Secondly, they respond by saying that we, we, we push the framing on them in this debate. We told that this debate is specifically about the mothers that don't find value in motherhood and how you harm them. The mothers that don't fit in. What was their response to this? The response was that some mothers don't find a home. However, we think we can evolve the system eventually in the future to incorporate those mothers. One, this debate is valuable. They can't teach me frame yourself by saying that because this debate has to take into account the harms of what happens when that narrative is widespread. They can't just say that we have the potential to create other narratives. 
to we will tell you that there is no response to the harms that we have given you. It's not enough for them to just say that there is a potential for your life to get better with your child, because in many instances it isn't. When there is financial cost to bringing up that child, it means that it comes a direct cost to you empowering yourself. It means you can't say for your job because you are forced to take care of a child 24-7. It means additionally that there is an emotional cost. Because sometimes women aren't prepared for the emotional cost of bringing a child into this world. The emotional cost of ensuring that you uh, that, that you develop them and intrinsically linking, linking your reward to how they are developed. Because that's the second harm that we warned you that they really haven't responded to. Because we told you that it harms women who are also currently mothers. How exactly does this happen? Because the emotional harm is incredibly bad when you are told that your drug addicted son is your fault. Because the reward is inherently linked to how you bring up that child. Because they are saying, they are saying that the reward is inherently how you bring up that child. But what does this look like? It looks like telling women that the reward of motherhood is going to be raising a child that eventually becomes a doctor. Therefore, what it implicitly implies is that your effort and your engagement into bringing that child up is how you get that reward. So in an instance where that doesn't happen, in an instance where your child spirals out of your control, you feel emotionally guilty. You feel guilt-ridden because you weren't able to get that reward because you failed. That's something that's going to be harmful. Before I move into my response, my substantive speech, yes. Please show the correlation of the belief in it being a custom for women to have children. So, sorry, please read that. Please show the correlation of the, of, the, of the belief in it being a custom to have a child then. Well, the belief obviously correlates to the custom to have a child. Because what a belief inherently does, and especially a widespread belief, is it coerces people into certain behavior, not only because of societal pressures, because of also because of how it influences your behavior and how you make that social cost. Because it's ingrained for you from a young age, it's all contact we've given in our first speech. But let's move on to my substance speech. Proving to you why this is likely to harm the relationship between mother and child, especially the development of that child. What exactly does this narrative say? First off, this narrative says that the reward of motherhood is inherently the emotional price. It's your child's gratefulness for you bring them up. It's your child's loving you back for you bring them up. How is this incredibly harmful for that relationship? Because children aren't like that. Children are inherently volatile. They'll get angry for no reason whatsoever. They'll start hating you for no reason whatsoever. In those instances, what is mother, what are mothers like to do? What does this narrative say that mothers should do? It says that mothers will continue to try and seek that emotional acceptance. It says that mothers will continue to try and seek that love and that gratefulness. In those instances, it's incredibly harmful because you create a relationship in which the mother is just continually giving with no with, with, with no consideration of how it affects the development of that child. Because ladies and gentlemen, it looks like mothers give their children whatever they want, even though in some instances they ought not. Secondly, how does it harm the father's role in parenting? I think this is also a really important part of this debate. Because what exactly this widespread belief emphasizes is that the role of the mother in raising a child is the most important one. Because it says that the role of a mother is the one that ought to be rewarded and therefore the one that ought to be incentivized. How exactly does this harm the dynamic now between father and mother? Because the reward emphasizes the mother's reward. It says that at the point at which mothers don't find that experience away, at the point at which mothers decide they aren't any more capable of taking care of that child, it isn't their responsibility to give it on to the father because there is an inherent reward in that experience. If you don't find that reward, you aren't trying hard enough. This is incredibly harmful because we've already analyzed to you in our first speech why there are some subjective conditions that may make these mothers incapable of being bearing a child. This not only looks like my natural conditions, also looks like characteristics. If you are not inherently a caregiver, if you are not inherently prone to loving things, then how are you supposed to take care of a child and a society that forces you to? What does that relationship look like? It's one that's incredibly harmful. Moreover, it gives bargaining power to the men within a relationship. It says that the, the, the men are accurate and are justified in saying that you ought to be the ones who take care of this child because you, there is a reward to this experience. I can opt out of taking care of that child and I can pursue my work because there is a reward Point. to this experience. In those instances, we would take to harm that dynamic. Before I continue, yes. Comment on the fact where the work is left for the kid and not the outcome such as the athletes that the kid may provide. You see, that's the problem here. We understand that some women may inherently love their child. We understand that some mothers may inherently love their children. But you aren't dealing with the blanket harms of when you say this is the this is the norm for all women within that society. When you incentivize women who aren't capable of being mothers, who don't want to be mothers, into that situation because the societal pressures are compensated by the fact that they expect some kind of reward. I've already analyzed to you why that's harmful to the relationship between mother and child, but let's deal with their response anyway. What do they tell us? They tell us that there's the, 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 the potential for you to love a child. But you're not dealing with the instances in which that potential doesn't exist. Because love isn't absolute. In many instances, that child can develop out of your control. That child has interaction with other people outside of their parents. That child can grow in a separately different way as you expect them to. Even in those instances, it's abhorrent to say that the mother 
or so love that child, when even though they're acting against his wishes. We tell you that in certain instances, the exact harm of this debate is that mother or mothers are forced to find inherent value in this love, but that, that value may not always exist for all people. In the ideal world in our science, one in which mothers evaluate their own circumstances, their own behavior, their own characteristics, and then decide whether or not to have a child. In the instance in which you are always told that this experience is going to be rewarding, it's not only one that is harmful to women, it's also harmful to men. Uh, once people think 
motherhood is bad. The orphan, uh, orphan, people in orphanages keep increasing because people do not see value in this money. So what happens in this case, not taken, what happens in this case is that government resources are stressing that they're forced to be maintaining um, and of course, we maintain the orphanages because people have been allowed to think that motherhood is not good. Point taken. We're not changing anything in terms of how people engage with motherhood. We have to evaluate what is done and whether or not that was valuable. Say that again. We're not changing anything. We have to evaluate what happened and whether or not that's valuable. You can't push that frame of to us as we're going to remove all motherhood. Well, psychopositions case is the one that is not one that just uh, leaves a debate where it is because it actually has a change in that it forces people into thinking that motherhood is not actually a rewarding experience because they somewhat base this debate and exaggerated it upon a group of people that are not actually even a majority. Also, um, if we look at this, one, they have not taken. They have been able to revolve this debate around how some people are not allowed. And, and put it in a boundaries where people are not allowed, uh, people are inherently not allowed to find fulfillment in other in other activities. But because because we see we see motherhood as a separate part of the society, motherhood is another contributing factor to what makes a society and the other activities that people can take in and find fulfillment in those other than the uh, no one that has been given. We still believe that motherhood should be allowed to still be viewed as an as a rewarding experience. Point taken. Even if it's not the majority of all women, we think that the majority of speaking about is women who's largely unaffected by this. We have to talk about the people who are actively harmed by the narrative. We're allowed to talk about these people that are actively harmed by the narrative. And this is because we in the society do not ban or see not being a mother as a not being a mother as a crime or anything that you're not allowed to take into. But what is happening is that when people are not people do not see motherhood as a rewarding experience, which it actually is in the majority of cases. We have okay, problems such as abortion, problems such as people giving up their children, problems such as people not even trying hard enough to even take charge of what the children are doing. Now, um, if we look at um, motherhood in the first place, they forget that there are all these parts of motherhood that everyone can feel, despite having thought um, from the beginning that motherhood is not actually a, a rewarding experience. From the first steps of your child, the first one they make not take it. The, the, the day, the first thing they go to school, when they get married and then all this fulfillment that we can get from such activities in that you get to see your child growing into um, this kind of person, a challenge that you have taken that will give you fulfillment. Now if a majority of the women feel this, uh, if a majority of women feel this, uh, this sense of fulfillment, and if women who take on to these challenges too can feel this uh, forms of emotions and fulfillment that can like weigh them in a way that is very advantageous to society because first of all we we'll also have happy people. So um, women should not be forced into believing that motherhood is not an a rewarding experience because we see fulfillment in motherhood.
even if it's not the majority of people who don't buy into the idea of, of, of it being something that's positive, we need to look at that very same minority and how it affects them. They give you things like the abortion, they give you things like child abandonment. What should we do for those very same people in that society who aborts their children because they felt that they didn't want to have that child? You tell them that they're evil because they choose not to have children, right? Because in your world it's meant to be a rewarding experience. You recognize that that's something that's harmful to your kids. Thirdly, they give us this idea, this idea that mothers who don't find value in, in this will adapt and they'll eventually find the experience of motherhood rewarding. Firstly, your example of child abandonment is a clear example of when individuals might not find motherhood is a clear example of something that contradicts that very same argument you've given us. If people adapt as time goes on, that means that child abandonment won't exist because that mere claim is the existence of people no longer finding that experience rewarding or other aspects that may exist. First, but secondly, we need to recognize that you shouldn't be forced to find something rewarding when you don't like it in the first place, right? Even in your case, where, we should, where they are allowed to do this, we don't think that this is something we should impose on them. Why do we think that we shouldn't? Why do we think that you shouldn't be coerced into believing that this is something that's beneficial to you? You shouldn't be coerced because your initial choice and your initial idea is something that is pivotal to exactly how you view that situation. Even if you do find it beneficial in the future, that mere fact, the mere fact that the process in which you found it beneficial was something that's not principally legitimate is something that's largely irrelevant and outside. Fourth thing they give you under this issue is, the, is that uh, is the idea that people is the idea that just because a mother finds value doesn't mean that a father that a father can't exist anyways, right? And this is where we need to understand exactly what this means for society. It means, within the most instances, that it, the burden of taking care of children, the burden of being involved in a child's life, is mainly premised or mainly forced upon mothers in the first place, right? And the idea of it being forced on mothers is what allows most of the time for the predominant existence of fathers to not be there, right? It allows fathers to not fully engage equally as mothers would within this instance. That's the first thing we tell you. But secondly, even if it did, this debate should be predicated and assessed on how it directly affects women, not a mechanism of how we can engineer our society. Even if they were talking about those benefits, my second issue is going to show you why they don't achieve them anyways. You beg to disagree. And so are you advocating for shutting down any belief that people have? No, I, that's not what this debate is about. It's not about shutting down any belief that people have. You think you're entitled to your own opinion and your own idea of how you conceptualize the world. But a predominant belief is, and why it's very much distinguished from what you're talking about, is that it imposes that idea on other people that this is what it has to be, right? This is what our case has been given you. You haven't engaged with that specific point of criteria. Fourthly, we, they gave you this idea that it's only a, minor, a minority of individuals who don't find this experience fulfilling. Firstly, assume that it is a minority of individuals. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't take into consideration the harm that it gives them. But secondly, to that very same majority who do find it fulfilling, what do you do for those very same people, right? You give them this idea that it has to be rosy, perfect, and daisy throughout every single second of that experience, right? At the point at which you don't like it anymore, Wait. at the point at which you're frustrated because you can't handle that situation, you're forced to stay in that situation because it's supposed to be something that's rewarding to you. Assuming this debate was about the majority, you still lose within that instance because you don't benefit them anyway. No thank you. Conclusion to this issue then becomes very simple. This debate ought to be assessed on how, on exactly how this narrative has affected women, and we think, on a principled level, it is not. It has affected women in a largely harmful way. Second issue: How does this affect society? How does this affect how society operates in general? Recognize that most of their analysis here isn't what this debate is about, right? Societal benefits aren't things that we find important, but I'm going to engage with it anyway. The first thing that they tell us here is that we'll have more people in society, which is somehow going to lead some sort of economic growth. Apart from the fact that we don't think that's what's important to do in today's debate, we need to recognize that overpopulation is an actual thing, right? Having more people in society doesn't equate to having a better economy in the first place. We have a large amount of African countries that have a high population, but at the same time, they don't have a better economy. And the reason why this argument is flawed is because it lacks mechanisms under their side to show us how it's going to lead to that. Secondly, they give us this idea that this narrative has been effective decreasing things like child abandonment and abortion. No, right? We don't think that's, that's what this is about. But even if it was effective in decreasing those very same things, recognize that child abandonment and abortion 
uh, mere existence of the choice of a woman, right? They choose to do those very same things. And you telling us that it limits that is a direct concession to the fact that it has limited women's choice within that instance, in that very same, within that very same instance. We don't think that this is something that's beneficial. And the third thing that we're given, uh, that we're given under this idea, is that when children grow up to be something, you get some sort of emotional fulfillment and a means of emotional happiness from this. Let's assume that that's true, right? What about the people who, like, the idea of you getting happiness from your child's growing up is that they grow up to be what you want them to be. What if your child doesn't grow up to be what your understanding is? Instead of being a doctor, they become an artist or something else that you don't believe in. For those very same people who don't get that emotional fulfillment, and you make situations far worse, not only for that parent, but for the child too. Ladies and gentlemen, this is principally illegitimate because it harms women to a great extent, very much both.
simply suggesting that if it is one spirit, one, we need to let people have an opinion on whatever experiences they have gone through. If a person has gone through motherhood and they experience that this experience is something good and they experience it with someone else, then they should have the freedom to expression of any opinions that they have. And second is that this one spirit belief is not the only factor that contributes to one person deciding whether they want to become a mother or not, because in the 21st century, people consider whether they have the finances to fund a family finances to fund these kids. And so it is not the only limiting factor, at least even the major factor limiting people to having kids. Now another thing is this, we do so that people say it's a widespread belief because we experience still that this belief has indeed a rewarding experience not only to the mother but also to society in terms of the economic and social benefits. Point taken before I went to my speech. Ma'am, the exact same thing as you're rebutting is what most of your case is based on. Then using that as a metric to make these decisions is what you get in your economic benefits and all of your benefits is based on. Now, Show my, us only how problem, my only problem is that still in their side, they're denying the majority to express their opinions. And what we're saying is that if majority express their opinions as opposed to the experience that they have, then we can also look into the advantages that they have had, not only to themselves, but also to society. And this is why we're bringing you this case of where you want to and this case where it influences the economy of the country as a whole. We're not saying that we're using women as a tool to make our economies better. We're saying that for women who have thrived and made this experience as a, uh, as a rewarding experience, yes, they have contributed to their societies, and yes, they have contributed to economies, and yes, they have contributed to the emotional attachment, emotional fulfillment that they get as mothers. They have not been able to prove to us how their mothers, in their own case, are basing this one belief as the only factor that they get to choose from whether they want to become mothers or not. And we have shown you how in the 21st century is not only a widespread belief, but how many people that you know that you're going to base on, you're going to base on much more things because, hey, it's the modern world and we know the impacts and things that it takes to raise a child and how much it is. So you put more stuff than just believing a widespread belief and have not shown us basically how this widespread belief is what is the only influence to women deciding whether they want to become mothers or not. And then they, again, they come and say the effects that these women have um, after they have seen that this experience is not rewarding at all. But then again, it brings me back to the non uniqueness of the case they're presenting. The fact that this woman indeed can see that it's not a rewarding experience is not because of this belief, dear judges. It's also because of the fact that maybe they even lack the resources to raise this child. Maybe the father has a bad her. Maybe there are all these other factors that can lead to this experience not being a rewarding experience. And team proposition has not been able to come and prove to us the uniqueness of their case as opposed to what we're showing in a team opposition, not taking. Now allow me to give you again the advantages it has to the mother, again the advantages it has to the social community, and the advantages it has to the to economic thrive of the nation. Now my first speaker came here and showed you the emotional attachment that a person has, which cannot be any way we get stripped away from a mother because first it is an emotional and irreplaceable existence of mother child bond, which also gives a sense of accomplishment and achievement if this mother indeed raises a child to become who they want them to become. And then they came here and said that yes, sometimes the person cannot uh, experience this rewarding experience because the, this person is not becoming who you want them to become. But we say that this is not unique to the fact that you want to become a mother and to the fact that you do not want to become a mother. And they do not show us the correlation to this as the harm of this. Now, second thing is that we show you how it indeed impacts the social pride and uh, social dynamic of our communities because who is making up the community is the people who are coming from the mothers. And from this same community is where we get never, which contributes to the economy's uh, thrive and the economy's development. Now, through all this, we're saying this from the experience of people who enjoy motherhood and who say that motherhood is good for them. And so this is why we're supporting that the widespread belief is indeed good because it does not in any way show how it's not a world experience for any mother. Thank you very much for your support. Point. Was that those words about how motherhood is rewarding that everyone is forced into believing? Their proposition of society is a group with it and ask them why in the century in the society we know in the society we know as now, why do they think that that's the truth? We believe that individuals in the society we know as now, as now are able to disagree with this general idea and we, they were not able to show us actually how this uh, narrative is forced into people and is make people believe that
that and do whatever it is they're saying. Now the whole premise of the whole idea they were giving us is that it hurts a, a, a small minority who does not fit, who not fit in this narrative. We told them that this narrative, they were not able to show us how this narrative is is not mutually ex exclusive with the other narratives that are not told to women in this century. That they can find wording in a, in, in, in some uh, in a hobby, they can find wording in a, a career, and they can find wording in other things. They were not able to show us that this narrative they're giving excludes all the other narratives that a woman in this century can have uh, can have to word for. We tell you that women will not, they, they ask us, they force us into believing that women, that we're asking women to carry all of this for the, for the benefit of the society, for the advantage of society. But we're not doing this. We're saying that because women can take on the choice to actually have women, ha uh, to take on the choice to have children, or we can see all these, these uh, advantages. Now, what, the only thing we're doing is we're telling them it is a good thing, but it's not the only thing that you can do. So if you choose to come with us, this is the thing that you're going to do for your society. You're going to allow us to construct a better society. You're going to allow us to, you're going to ask to provide a better society. You're going to allow us to develop economically. You're going to allow us to give a chance to other orphans and give, uh, give a chance to other children who, may, who were probably uh, given out by their own parents. We're giving you, the, we're giving them the ability to make a choice to contribute to society, but first of all, the choice has to be made by them, and in no way the, this narrative or this password is forcing them to go out of the narrative that they're telling themselves. Now, they tell us that we have to base on this debate on these few people who are actually harmed by this by, by this narrative. But we tell them that they all that it is not this this narrative that is not the only one that forces someone to go into having a child. That there are so many things in this century that people take into consideration why they're making a, a, a why they're making a choice to become a mother, which is not only the fact that motherhood could be rewarded. We tell them that they can be able to make the choice if they want it or not. Now, we believe that if someone does not want to follow this narrative, they can choose not to have a child, and we agree with that. But we're saying that if, if they want to have a child, because the narrative will tell them, then they're having and helping the whole society as a whole. Now, this whole debate was them trying to put us in a corner of accepting that sometimes what is true for one is not true for the other. Now, we're arguing with this. We're arguing that some women in some instances may not be able to fit in this scenario. But what we're saying is that the advantages we see on a side where women can know that they can have a rewarding experience from the experience of from the fact of being mother, they are much more extensive and much more important than the few disadvantage we can see when women are told to, to that they can, when women are told that motherhood is something which is rewarding. At the end of it all, the debate was about what, where do we see more good in telling women that they, the motherhood is rewarding or in telling them that motherhood is rewarding. We have been showing you there was four, four main four main benefits in doing so to women, and the only disadvantage they were able to tell us are the advantages that are not unique only to the widespread, but can also be uh, accept can also be due to other factors that they did not that, that we were able to mention throughout our speeches. Without all that said, we believe that the side that's going to be able to tell us today is the side that shows how this this widespread gives more advantage and it's something that the opposition team was able to do. Thank you. Thank you for your speech. And now I'd like to ask the reply speaker for the side of opposition to finish the debate. For the thousands of women across America who have, who have had to turn to narcotics because they don't like motherhood and they don't like their lives, we think that it is utterly insulting for opposition to tell you that they are an extreme minority and that they will not gain much in this debate. We think that it is an insult to those women and the choices they have been forced into. How am I going to evaluate this debate? I'm going to go a lot of strategic framing to show what we think that the opposition cannot buy their daily strategy in the debate. But beyond that, there are two questions. One, when do we get a narrative? And secondly, how does this affect familial relations? Okay, for that, let's do some important strategy, right? We have to frame a lot of things out of the debate, but they have engaged with what the point is, right? We're going to do this in three ways. One, but what, who was the debate about? We think that this debate was largely about women, that they are likely to be affected the most by this narrative and that they are the most vulnerable people within this narrative. They try to frame this out by trying to tell you how this debate is purely for the interests of society. We think that's important. We think that this debate is purely about those women. We already gave you analysis on how we think that this, it ought to be about those who are affected the most. 
But they did try and do this, telling you that these women are not a majority. They told you that that's a humiliating lie, that a lot of women are forced into motherhood, right? They told you that a lot of them are pushed into it. But we told them, even in the instance in which it is a minority, which we somehow mistook for a concession, we told you that we think that they are the ones we still ought to be focusing on. Because the women who love motherhood, like they see on their side, are unaffected by the narrative. The ones who are affected are the ones we should prioritize. The second question, can this narrative coexist with other narratives? We told you that that's untrue. Because women are fed this narrative from the moment they begin to understand anything. And that is fed to them through mass media, through their parents, through all of their surroundings. This was done in the first four minutes of my speech, right? But, we talk, like, but, but more of we told you that it specifically shuts out others by forcing people who have struggled with parenting to stay silent. We also did this context, they decided to ignore it, right? But even in the instance in which there is room for other narratives, they have to engage with what it means for a widespread narrative to exist. That even if it's not the only one, it's the predominant one and it still has a lot of power. The third one, how many factors affect whether or not people decide to have children? I mean, we told you that this is a very, very strong factor in doing that, which is why women who don't have financial capability or support may still have children because of that belief, right? We think that this, it is a very strong factor, even if it isn't the only one. And we've got into the clash, it's also worth noting that the Given that they try and characterize the women who don't like motherhood as a minority, they can't actually keep both characterizations and get their benefits right. Because their benefits are premised on how when people think it's not valuable, they won't do that anymore, but somehow that value is inherent to who they are, who they have to pick one of these characterizations. Okay, now let's talk about the two questions. One, when do you get a narrative? I told you that you get it when it's a black portrayal and excludes people who have specific nuances within that. I told you about people who, even if badly, aren't able to access that role. Find and people who don't even want kids, right? But more we told that it harms them without their consent. What do we get in response to this? Three things. One, that this is not unique to the belief on women, right? That's cool. It doesn't have to be unique to the belief on motherhood. We told you that it's unique to the fact that it's widespread. We told you that it's unique to the fact that it's something that people are fed from a very, very age. Even if we do it with other beliefs, we don't think that it counts, right? This also means that the point on expression literally doesn't mean much. Because a lot of their, their case was premised on us changing something which we don't do. We told you that value and that that value can be in that love alone. That is okay for some people to find value in that. We don't think it's everyone though. And that narrative that they're feeling is the exact same narrative that women continue to be fed throughout their lives. The next thing we told you was that it harms familial relations in terms of the mother to child relationship and the father to child relationship. We try to convince you here that this does not completely exclude fathers, right? I told you that it's fine, but it makes it easier for them to opt out, it makes it harder for them to opt in to being active and good fathers, right? But beyond that, we would do the way of think that harming families and harming women so greatly is something we can never expect to try and use them as a means to an end to advance society, right? We think that it's not valuable for you to use people as a cogs to get a good society and a good economy that is evil and on that basis, we think that we regret this narrative.